Antwort. Hm. Hm. Ja, you warmed, you warmed us up. Okay. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, everybody, uh, and welcome. Yeah, my, when my wife is asked what I do, she says I sell stuff. So that was, that's actually quite quite nice to hear it put in a slightly different format. Um, what I want to do today is obviously um, talk a little bit more uh, about some of the regulations uh, and, and how they're really affecting CTU uh, movements and shipments. But um, probably um, if we can get it to move, nothing's happening, sir. Yep, okay. Okay, should be okay now. <laughs> okay. Um, let's uh, have a quick look at the agenda. So, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Cordstrap. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, you know, we are uh, probably the world's leading company in cargo securing, one-way ca cargo securing. Um, then I'll, I'll share a little bit about why we think cargo securing is important and why it's a little bit of a, an obsession. Um, then I'll, I'll share some thoughts on compliance um you know who the organizations are um and what what is involved um regulations that are applicable um and the impact that it has on activities organizations and even the planet in a, in a more global view and finally we'll take a little bit of a look at iot or the internet of things and see how that is beginning to transform uh, how people are operating and thinking in the shipping industry. So, um, for over, 30, over 50 years, in fact, Cordstrap have um, been working with one real main goal, and that is to keep the world's cargo safe. Um, who are we? Um, we're basically a global company uh, based in Holland um, and we provide cargo securing solutions worldwide. We have a world-class team of over 300 plus uh, cargo securing experts and we work directly with manufacturers and three and four PL organizations and companies to enable safe and damage-free transport of goods. Um, our aims are really to provide safety and consistency in cargo securing. Um, you know, we really are focusing on reducing risk. We are very closely aligned to regulatory compliance. Um, we are also looking at time and cost efficiencies, particularly for our our customers, you know, we, we want to provide our partners with value. Uh, and that is one of our core um, business objectives. So if we, you know, if we're doing our job well, we will enable business around the world to operate successfully, 
safely and efficiently. And that obviously helps their businesses to grow and obviously hopefully to make them prosperous as well. So Cordstrap really is the only true global cargo securing company. We have representation in over 50 countries. Um, we have a highly unique perspective on the needs of some of the world's um, largest shipping businesses. We are pretty well uh, aware and, and, and take it very seriously the various regulations that are applied to our business, not just here in Europe, but around the world. And this means that working in accordance with global standards set by IMO, uh, for all the uh, modes of inter intermodal tra uh, cargo, we really sort of join hands with uh, export packers, surveyors, like your, your good selves, uh, logistic companies, shipping lines, um, and government organizations. Again, focusing back to ensure safe shipping. So obviously today, part of my presentation and, 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 and focus is, is going to be on hazardous and dangerous uh, cargoes, dangerous goods. But of course, all container shipments needs correct uh, securement. Um, but obviously for hazardous cargo, it's an absolute must. And, you know, we're talking about, um, Jan was talking about, fires on, on vessels, in particular, we're interested in securing in, in CTUs in the shipping container, which is a little bit of a closed box. You know, as you were pulling things out of your box. I could see you were a magician and a, and a con shipping container is a, is a closed box and you really don't know what's inside it. It might have a manifest, it might have a declaration, but when you actually open the doors, it could be something completely different. So I think, um, you know, what we've got to say is that you know we have a a lot of uh, partner partnering now with chemical companies globally um, because they recognize the need to have safe compliant um, consistent cargo securing solutions because it for them it's invaluable you know you cannot have a uh, reputational accident you know something that really affects their brand in a nasty way so they are one of the areas that we, we see as being very much to the fore um, as, uh, of interest to us. And if you think about um, the scope of this business, you know, there's over 100 million cargo uh, con container shipments per annum. And 85% of those movements are by sea. So, you know, the majority of a shipping container movements are by sea. In an intermodal transportation, you, know, you have rail, you have air, you have road, you have sea. But primarily marine sea is, is the area where we see uh, the greatest concentration. And, you know, cost to business runs into billions of dollars if you have poorly or insecurely secured container cargoes. or misrepresented you know we'll talk about that a little bit later but there are quite a few incidences where people are deliberately mis declaring cargoes in the inside of the uh, container but you have to think about the 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 uh, implication for any type of mishap any type of accident you know not only is it is is the damage um, but you also have disruption to to uh, supply chains, productivity losses, etc., which are quite difficult to quantify. So apart from the, the purely the, 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 the physical damage, there's a lot of other knock-on damage um, coming in. And also, it's not just money. You know, we talked about loss of life earlier. And, you know, you, you said fortunately only four people were, were, were killed. And I, under my breath, said, well, you know, not so fortunate if you were one of the four. So, you know, any loss of life is particularly concerning. And I think um, 
you know, there is a, a shift change and I'll talk about, we, we mentioned Maersk earlier. Um, I'll talk about Maersk because Maersk seems to be um, quite active and leading the way in how they want to uh, view container shipments on board their vessels. Um, and I think, you know, increasingly the responsibility of business and, and, and productivity loss is really being pushed back to the shippers. And it's not really the shippers who are, who are, are at fault. It's actually the people who are stuffing the container in the first place or declaring the container in the first place. Hapagloi quote that there's a fire on board a vessel approximately every eight weeks. So every eight weeks, there's a, a vessel fire. And there's, again, billions of dollars of impact for these vessels. I think, yeah, you were saying 200, or was it $300 million of which 200 million was, was paid out? These are big, big numbers, big numbers. What we, what we see and, and what, um, you know, if you look at the organizational side of it, SINs, which is the, you know, the cargo incident notification system, has really um, picked it up and it, it, it's now has about 17 members, including five of the major shipping uh, lines. Now, they report that 50% of the incidents that they have uh, picked up and recorded are due, due to uh, either poor securing or uh, incorrect securing in containers. So there's a high level of incidents. And of course, you know, this keeps um, I suppose a very high profile because if you think about the super tankers, now, uh, super container um, carriers now, where you have over thirty thousand containers on a vessel, the value of that cargo, approximately, can be between two hundred and fifty and three hundred million US dollars on board one vessel at one time if it's fully loaded, taking an average value per, per container. So it, it becomes more and more relevant that, you know, correct declaration and correct um, securing practice becomes mandatory. So, um, you know, as I said earlier, some of the shipping lines are leading the way. MERSP in particular have commenced a container inspection pilot study. Some of you might have seen this uh, reported. And that was, uh, I think, led primarily um, by the fact that they had a, a, a tragic fire on board one of their vessels, the Honam, in March 2018, and they lost five members of, of, of the crew. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, later, but I think that was the catalyst for Maersk to really look at how they treat safety in a, in a slightly different way than, than in the past. And what we also find, obviously, is that regulations are becoming tougher. They are becoming stricter. I did look at stricter because stricter is a bit of a funny word from an English point of view, whether it's grammatically correct, but they say it is. So um, I think, you know, regulation will only become more and more uh, precise and more and more tight, you know, particularly in the first world, as we said, Regulation is pretty well adhered to. Um, certainly in, in some of the markets where I oper have been operating and still operate, you know, um, they are less uh, taken into consideration, shall I say. So, you know, the, there is still an educational um, route to go and I'll probably be retired and somebody else will have to pick it up and take on, but it was, it's still there. So, you know, we have to... Um, have to look at this and you know to address the issue of poor and incorrect uh, securing the latest version of IMDG code which is the amendment that I referred to 3816 and it came into force January uh, 2018 makes explicit reference to the CTU code on how to secure cargo correctly. The IMDG code is ob obligatory in maritime law for all SOLAS nations which means basically almost 100%. 99% are, are dialed into SOLAS. 
Um, and the CTU code is the IMO, the ILO, and the UNECE code of practice for packaging of cargo transport units. So complying to the CTU code means that you're complying to IMDG regarding how you're securing your cargo. So let's have a look at, uh, at the CTU code because that really is probably the cornerstone for most of how cargo uh, should be um, secured in containers. You know, it details the safe way to secure within a container. It outlines um, the chain of responsibilities. There, it also gives you uh, different transport conditions, um, tells you how to check the CTU itself, the physical CTU. A CTU is basically a 20 foot container. That's what a CTU stands for. It's, it's, you see, we have two sizes, 20 foot, 40 foot, but everything is measured in 20 foot. It's referring to a CTU. It refers to a standard 20 foot steel container. Um, it also gives you guidance on how to manage dangerous goods, uh, how to close and un unpack a, uh, a container, and also some training as well. Um, it also gives you accurate uh, measurements to calculate forces and securing arrangements across any of the modes of transport. So don't forget, although we're, we're talking about a shipping container, it can start its life on a truck. It can actually get, then go on to a vessel. So it can also be picked up by, by uh, cargo movement equipment at the dock side. It goes on a vessel. Forces on sea are completely different from forces on, on, on a truck. It gets, for example, to North America. It comes off the vessel, it gets put onto a rail track. So Association of uh, American Railway standards would apply, but the forces in, a, in a, a rail truck are completely different from a road truck or a shipping line. So there are different forces applicable, which people need to be aware of. Um, and obviously, you know, you have to secure to make sure that you meet the maximum. Leaving. So I think I pressed that twice. Where am I? Hang on. I think I. Yeah, there we go. So, um, CTU code. Okay, CTU code doesn't really uh, conflict with or supersede um, any existing national or international regulations. So, for example, I mentioned rail in, in America. They have their own regulatory uh, board, uh, which is called AAR, America, the, the Association of American Railways. Their code would actually take priority over CTU code. Doesn't mean CTU code is, is not relevant for their point of view. And actually a lot of their uh, standards are, 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 are tougher because if you, know, if you can imagine um, a big, um, freight tr uh, train in, in, in the States, uh, you know, maybe 100, 150 carriages, all with containers on board, and you get a lot of shunting. You know, the one at the end is <laughs> it's, it's probably doing about 3,000 miles an hour, and the one at the front started at five. So, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a lot to, to consider. You know, in, in other regions like Asia Pacific, there's little or no regulation. You know, if I go to the uh, dockside in, in um, Mumbai, for example, you know, could be quite interesting to say, uh, to say the least. You know, there's not a lot of um, regulatory um, sort of compliance that you would recognize anyway. But having said that, the CTU code is still the central part of the Bible. Um, that is used for reference and determining whether your cargo was secured correctly or not. Um, we'll talk about incoming shipments in a moment. You know, the damages that result from in, uh, improper packaging um, is, is showing um, that a lot of the, you know, if it's proven that you didn't pack 
or you didn't secure properly, they'll reject your claim. So it, it, it becomes sort of self-perpetuating that you need, do need to um, pick up and, and understand how cargo is being secured. I mentioned about Maersk. I think this is, this is quite interesting. It is that they launched a pilot study in America in uh, four ports. I can't remember them all, but I did make a note of them. Newark, Houston, Miami, and New Orleans. Now, this is a um, project that they're running with SINs, the CINS, and also with the assistance of the National Bureau in, in North America. And they have targeted in, to inspect 500 containers with, through these ports, both incoming and outgoing containers. Um, and um, it's a random thing. What I understand, and I'll, I'll tell you how I understand that, um, there is a bit of focus on, on the randomness. Um, also something that they expect to um, roll out internationally into 2020, into next year. So although it's a North study at the moment, but what I can tell you is out of the 500 containers so far, they have inspected about 350. And the reason I can tell you that is because I was at Maersk head office two weeks ago in Copenhagen. They have also appointed a senior manager who is, um, I think his title is cargo verification something or other. It's a bit of a long-winded one. But what they're doing is they are, they have obviously acres acres of data, um, but they don't know well, until now. Have never really been able to be in a position to to really work at this data. And what's driving it, in fact, and I picked this up because this is quite their sustainability report. And I picked it up because I thought, oh, I'll, I'll have a read of that on the plane back because I hadn't got anything to read. I was thinking it would be quite, but within it, there's a, there's a real um, marker, which is safety. Out of all of their sustainability targets, this is the one that they don't meet, that they failed. And it says here, quite not met. If you look at everything else, it's either met or partly met. And safety, which you would think is the most important, they've actually been bold enough to say they haven't met it. And why haven't they met it? Particularly last year. One was the fire on the Maersk Hunap, where they lost five people. They lost one guy in India to an exploding tire up port side. He got hit by a, a, a tire. And I think the other one was in uh, their container manufacturing operation. He got trapped between two steel plates. So they lost seven members of the AP Mola Maersk organization. And they have about 80 something thousand employees. And for the last five years, they have lost 35 lives, 35 employees for various reasons. So they have taken a completely new look at how they view safety. And this pilot study is part of that process in the fact that they are now um, trying to understand <laughs> what is being put on board vessel because obviously you know if you've got chemical dangerous goods hazardous goods do you want to put that particular container next to um, living quarters next to the engine room um, you know so there's some interest there but also they need to understand what is going on board the vessel in a better way so um what they could tell me so far, and there will be a, a, an official report coming out, and when it comes out, I think it's going to make interesting reading. Not surprisingly, they said to me, okay, yeah, you know, we can see between 60 and 80% of containers, shipping containers that we are moving out of China and out of India are not to specification. They're not, they're poorly secure, they're not to specification. So you think, okay, you know, we're Europe, we must be good. He then tells me that 30% of the shipping containers from Europe also are not to standard, not to CTU code, not secured correctly. 
the big issue is, as I said earlier, it's a, you know, it's a steel box and it's sealed and it's closed. He also told me that they probably inspect less than 0.01 of all their shipping container movements. And they move about 10 million. So uh, per annum. So you can see, and the reason being is it actually costs an extraordinary amount of money to do, to do it. You know, you've got to select a container, you've got to move it out of the, out of the, the storage bank, you open it, you've got to check it, you've got to put it back. The only way they can do this is because SINs and, and the National Bureau in North America are assisting. So I think, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the fact that it's difficult now is real. Uh, Maersk have certainly top management have realized it, that's not an excuse. You know, they have to be better than they have to cut out any incidents of fires on board vessels and securing the cargo or inspecting the cargo is one way of doing that. They also have appointed four specialists. So there's one in Denmark covering Europe, one in India, one in China, and one will be appointed in um, Panama, I think he said to me. So, and they're actually tracking back now. So when, of these 350 that they've inspected, they're tracking back to see where it came from and who actually was responsible for securing. Because it might not have been the manufacturer. It could have gone to a 3PL or 4PL. So there could have been a third party involved. And the reason that we're talking, and I'm talking to, to these to Maersk is because you know they're experts in ship <laughs> as he said to me I'm not an expert in cargo securing you're the expert I need why can't we work together I need you as a partner so that when we find these customers you can come in and teach them how to do it correctly hopefully I think it's going to be a long a long journey but particularly in China and and uh, and India, you know, I was in China last week in, in, um, and came back at the weekend and, you know, it's still price, cost, anything to try and cut down, particularly now that things are a little bit tighter as well with, the, with America and, and trade is a little bit weaker. Anyway, back to the CTU code. How am I doing for time? Okay. The code identifies, the, you know, the behaviours and the actions that are key to safe packaging and transport of cargo. So best practices are shared within the code and emphasis is given to practice that should be disencouraged. disencouraged. There's a chain of responsibility. Um, it's outlined in detail um, and it's, you know, how the responsibility of the shipper uh, and the packer, um, you know, how they plan the load and the securing of the cargo um, from the nature of the cargo. Uh, how it's packed, um, to loading and securing, to materials that are used, weight distribution within the um, within the, the the shipping container, anti-slip properties, uh, tip techniques, etc. You know, I, I'm talking about um, you know dangerous goods, but don't forget, in some cases they put steel coils in shipping containers, steel coils that weigh 20 plus tons. I've seen them through the floor quite a few times because they either put it in the wrong place, they don't secure it properly, they don't spread the load. So it's not just has chem. There's a lot of stuff that goes in shipping containers that, that does create a problem uh, or potential problem. The shipper is responsible and will be held liable for any losses and damages. Um, and the guide helps to avoid problems that would lead to any liabilities. So, you know, in the past, people have shoved stuff into containers, closed the doors and rubbed their hands and said, okay, fine, thank you. Now follows them. Um, country for cargo, um, or, you know, correct cargo techniques is Germany. They even have trained police forces in Germany that are stopping trucks because of, they can see it's pure, you know, poorly uh, secured. We're not quite that level here in the UK, but certainly Germany lead the way. You don't see that in, in um, you know, in Africa, India, some of the Southeast Asia, China, obviously. Um, 
Right. The code also covers practices that can be applied to any load, as I've just said. Um, you know, so not only chemical, machinery, equipment, steel and metal, food and beverage, etc. They are all covered by the CTU code. Um, it provides actionable advice uh, on how to protect primary packaging, um, filling voids within a container. Um, it calculates the forces generated during transit. Um, there's also insights into wood and bracing methods, uh, shoring and wedges, hardwood versus softwood, dry to wet, as well as fumigation and, and um, uh, what uh, the, the uh, I can't remember the word now, phytosanitary regulations, which is the, the, the treatment of the, the wood, etc. Um, also makes special reference to maximum ca capacity and how to avoid using securing devices that are greater than the strength of the, the MSL. MSL is the, you know, the maximum safe load of the securing rings. I don't, if, you, if you know much about a container, it's pretty boring, it's a box, but it has securing rings at the top and at the bottom. The, the uh, MSL for the top securing um, lugs are, is, is 500 kg. For the bottom ones, it's, it's one ton. So any calculator has to use that as their minimum, as their maximum size, should I say. So, you know, if, you, if it's no good saying, well, I've got a 10 ton piece of lashing, and you're securing to a one ton. You need, so you need to understand forces and what you can do and what you can't do. Um, so um, make sure that, you know, um, that's clear because it also, t to help you, to assist you, it sort of tells you what not to do. It gives you practices of what not to do. Um, you know, engine engineered, overstressed, um, applications are pushed beyond, um, you know, uh, normal loading capacities, etc. So it, it is pretty, pretty useful tool. Um, there is a section dedicated to uh, dangerous goods um, um, for international maritime transportation. Uh, and also it makes reference to IMDG, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, and it also outlines how that interface um, plays together. There are guidelines on hazardous and non-hazardous. So we can have hazardous and non-has in the same container. Um, and also, makes it uh, visible for you guys, if you're inspecting containers, how, uh, how you can see that. There's also correct packaging labeling and placards as well. Um, there's advice on unpacking the container because goods might have been shifted. You tend to think that it's safe. You open the door, 10 tons falls on top of somebody and he's dead. If it's not secured correctly. It's come up against the door, it's tilted, open I've, and I've seen unfortunate accidents happen like that um, classic one was in 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 China recently I had a, a I involved one of our shipments so caught that we're shipping goods all around the world we shipped a can, container out of Dubai to China and I got a load of uh, photographs and a very irate email saying that they had unloaded the container and during unloading somebody had been injured because this uh, pallet of metal parts had fallen on top of them and I looked at the pictures you know you do think oh, God, why has this happened and what had happened was the Chinese customs had inspected the container they'd taken it out and they'd put it back and they put it back completely in the wrong way so they put all the heavy pallets on top and hadn't secured them properly I just said you need to refer to your customs not us because we have photographs you know if you if if you're sensible when you're packing a shipping container always photograph what you've done because if there is a claim or potential claim you you say well it left here look like this this is how it was, how it was secured and have the photographic evidence um, there's also uh, guidance notes on fumica uh, fum fumication of, of, of cargo 
Um, because if, for, don't forget, you know, if you have chemicals in a shipping container and it's cleared out and there has been some spillage, there's potentially there could still be some residue of chemical there. Um, you know, it's good practice to vent a container for 10 or 15 minutes before you go inside it because you don't know where it's been. You don't know what it's been carrying before you, you've had it. You open the door, you walk straight in. You could be walking into a, a time bomb of, of, of toxic air. Um, and, you know, all CTU should be clean before they're returned. So if you get a CTU container delivered and it's dirty, send it back. Don't accept it. Don't accept it because you don't know where, what, what's in it or where, where it's been or it's, it's a, it's a, it's a concern. Um, so the only way it's the CTU code can be successful if it's, uh, put in place by people who have the correct skills. It's like anything in life, you know, people have got to be trained. They've got to be skilled in, and, and know what they're doing when they're securing cargo. Um, and a lot of people need that training. Um, and it takes a little bit of time, you know, it's like most of these things, it, there's a black art to, to, to car, cargo securing and you're not an expert overnight. It takes a little bit of time. Um, wherever CTU containers are being packed, that is the, you know, the management there are the, are responsible for making sure that all the people involved are adequately trained. Obviously, you know, if, if training is an issue and it's of interest, we do have um, skilled training facilities. We are able to do on-site training. We have a number of my colleagues who are um, certified marine surveyors um, who are colleagues. So, you know, we understand the technology, the terminologies, and we have training courses available. So if you ever get asked about cargo securing, and if can anybody help please remember the guy in london in june um let's move on to imdg because i ttu sort of pull together about 15 minutes 10 minutes imdg regulations um are comprehensive they're globally accepted um and it enables, you know, dang uh, package dangerous goods and marine pollutants to be carried around the world safely. It also focuses on why do accidents happen, it gives you some good guidance. Um, and some of these things are, you know, incorrect declarations we talked about or non-declarations by shippers, which can either be, you know, if I'm being charitable, lack of knowledge, or probably a little bit more likely, uh, you know, there's a bit of willful withholding of information because they want to avoid dangerous goods surcharging. So, you know, uh, you have to take that into consideration. And this is something that Maersk are doing with this validation. Cargo validation is check. It, they, they basically have a computer system that is able to, to search and find common uh, listings and the common listings are the ones that they've had problems with fairly quickly so they can start to search back and, and target and focus so it's not a needle in a haystack um, it also looks at quality and selection of the packaging materials you know normally a lot of chemical is in steel drum but it can be in big bag it can be in soft packaging it can be in pl plastic uh, drums um, cans, etc. So there's all sorts of different packaging to take in, into um, into account. Um, it looks at the provision and accuracy of the documentation, uh, which we've said, you know, it must be as you've declared. Um, we have the same photographs, I think. <laughs> so, you know, managing a fire on board a vessel on deck is uh, uh, and you know what it is you know it's it's some um maybe uh, some quarters are going up in in smoke etc is a little bit different from knowing uh, you know how do you tackle a fire below deck and you don't know what it is 
there's a fire in a container, but you do not know what is in that container. You don't know where that particular fire started, you know, roughly, but it could cover 50 containers. So scope is, is, is quite difficult when you're looking at fire, particularly from a container. You know, you have inconsistent company rules, sometimes standards and resources. Many multinationals now are, I would say, pretty good. They do declare correctly. Um, and they have SOP in place, particularly when it comes to um, IMDG regulations. Some of the smaller companies, then we see, you know, where they have resource issue or maybe they just are being, you know, they don't want to pay. Um, then you can see problems. So, you know, some operators, some, you know, aren't ethical and they will deliberately misdeclare. And that's where you have a big concern. Um, there's also, you know, sizable challenges in language, you know, particularly globally. We, we all take it for, uh, for granted, you know, that, that English is a recognized business language. But in a lot of countries, you know, I, 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 I go to Japan, half the time in Japan, I need a translator. But most of, a lot of Japanese guys or ladies don't, don't have a good grasp of English. So you do need, if, particularly if you're talking technical, you do need a competent translator. Um, you know, so second, second language you have to understand. Um, you also have some governments who are not quite so tuned into um, how, I suppose what you call global harmonized systems can benefit them. Um, again, like the CTU, you, know, you need knowledge, you need training, and you need proper implementation. Without it, the rules are going to be broken. They're not going to be kept to. And, you know, training for DG is mandatory. You have to have it. It's only as good as the people who are operating it, um, and you have to have accurate um, documentation, etc. Um, you know what I am seeing as well is is an increase of uh, DG container shipments that are coming into Europe being um, inspected and also being rejected. So particularly in the last two or three weeks, I've seen two shipments from South Korea, DG, into Antwerp, um, and they were inspected, random inspection, and they were. Uh, found not to be compliant to CTU code, and they had a uh, an average cost of putting it right of about seven eight hundred euros. Interesting thing was that the ship from uh, South Korea. I'm not sure if I should say this, but it's, it's, they had had the container inspected by Comdi. Comdi is the South Korean government organization responsible for cargo and cargo securing uh, its chain and they'd given it all clear ctu code it got to antwerp and it got rejected anyway. so there's still work to be done um yeah i think i've talked about a lot of this i mean basically you know there is um, a continuous push for UN um, government recognize, you know, governments are recognize the UN coding to adopt and reinforce these legislations um, and, and to make sure they are compliant. You know, we as a global leader in our industry are also interested, um, you know, to bring awareness um, because ultimately we're interested in safe transportation. Um, I'll move on through that because I know I can see time is eating in. Yeah. Very quickly, I just want to talk about the Internet of Things. Where, you know, we, talk, we had this very interesting opening session where we showed that basically anything that we have which is electronic is hacked. I, I sat there and thought, well, what do I do? You know, I think by the grace of God, most of us, touch wood, aren't affected. But you can see how easy it is. But, you know, the... The Internet of Things basically refers to um, connectivity be, you know, beyond the conventional computing platforms that we're used to um, into any range of traditionally non-internet enabled physical 
to prices, e.g. like a cargo ship, cargo carrying ship. So there's a lot of information um, that creates a new source of value to us. Um, and it can be managed in its own right, real time, anywhere in the world. Um, it's not a trend, it's overdue, um, and it's giving us better information throughout the supply chain. And it will transform how we can ship and manage cargoes around the world. Um, maybe in the past, you know, the shipping industry has been a bit slow to pick up on digitization, but I see now there is a real move. Um, and, you know, it's, it, the shipping industry is quite fragmented. fragmented. Um, you know, it's global, so it's all here, here, here. There are some very big players. Um, but, you know, it's probably one of the least visible sectors to the general public. Um, but there's still risk. You know, we've seen risk. You know, I talked about Maersk, you know, seven deaths, employee deaths last year. And they say it's not acceptable. It has to stop. Um, you know, and also one of the reasons probably too um, quick to pick up is, is the, all this physical cargo, you know, moving from and, and a lot of it is paper manifest, et cetera, et cetera. All that is starting to change. Um, and I, you know, in January of this year, there was a study done with 125 global ship line owners. And just give you a few of the insights. 75% plan to fully deploy internet of thinking based solutions for the vessels, for all their vessels within 18 months. Average expenditure on these solutions will be approximately $2.5 million per shipping business. 75% said that they expected to make savings from, from in, these implementations. 65% said a lot of it is due to environmental change. You know, we talked about, I talked about sustainability. Um, but 70% cited providing insurers with more data is a key driver for their adoption. One of the things that um, Maersk are doing as well, I don't know if anybody has seen this, is, is this Trade Lens. Trade Lens is, is a, a partnership where it uh, gives you full transparency of cargo moves. It creates seamless, real-time, actionable supply chain information. It was a bit slow to get away, but now MS, uh, MSC and also um, CMA, uh, CGM, you know, they're the second and fourth largest, I think, um, container shipping uh, lines are joined into it now. And basically what it does, you know, this is this blockchain um, technology. A lot of this is, is all sort of buzzwords and stuff. Don't worry about it too much. It basically means that they can get a lot more information out of what was previously seen to be sort of data, dead um, data. You know, it allows container logistic companies to have a shared view of shipping transa uh, transaction data with member firms acting as nodes in a way to supply, uh, to support the blockchain system. It will facilitate interactions between shippers, regulatory and administrative entities. It will lead to increasing speed of cargo clearance and movement of goods across borders. Interesting to see that uh, Russia has just adopted trade, trade lens. Um, so we're getting into a world of smart shipping um, you know, end to end viewing of the life of the cargo. Um, we can, you know, in a shipping, uh, you know, I can provide uh, customers with, with, with uh, solutions that will, you know, measure its location, providing the GPS is a <laughs> reset, uh, temperature within a container fluctuates massively depending on which way you're, you're shipping around the world, if you're going across the equator or not. Moisture from humidity, container rain, as we call it, risk of theft and tampering on the container, impacts on the container, cargo shifting. We can do all of that now in real time. Um, and that, you know, this can be then expanded into this blockchain trade lens so that they could pull it all in together. So there's a massive expansion of data um, to optimize 
solutions to protect any of the cargoes we have. I think also, you know, you have to be, you know, there's a lot of hype, but, you know, so take a realistic view of what is required. For, you know, if, you're, if you are involved in container surveying, look at, um, you know, what is actually required by your customers, by whoever's asking you, and, and see what is realistic. But there are plenty of solutions out there. And then finally, you know, just to really finish off, you know, it's a changing world changing world you know we've got tariffs we've got protectionism um you know maybe a little bit of deglobalization going on um but all of this uh change is sort of forcing rapid adaptation of new methods you know there's resource scarcity um you know which drives a bit of a circular economy and it and, uh, and it makes a bit of a shifting landscape um you know but within all that, digital has shown us that it has the power to make really step changes. And that's something that we, we have to, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Luddite. You know, I, when I was in, in, in school, it was still, you know, feet and inches, pound shillings and pence. So, you know, you do have to whiz the, the brain a little bit, but it, it's, it's worth it. But, you know, if you, if you can take it on board, there are rapid gains to be made, particularly, I think, in the surveying um, area um and i i think what you know i finish is that you know we really all need to be ready and able to adapt to to maximize uh, and get full benefit and full value out of these changes um so yeah that's me i think i just something to finish off and, and give you a little bit of thought when you're traveling home That was quick then. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Got it.